Well, good, good morning, and um, welcome to the uh, ME429 um, Propulsion System Design uh, Project, which is the engine design for the uh, previous teams, the uh, aero teams uh, aircraft. So, um, let me introduce Kevin uh, Romain, and he was the design team lead for uh, more than enough propulsion. So, that's what as Dr. Haven said, we are more than enough propulsion. We're the mechanical engineering team designing the engines for Fire for Effect. Today we will be giving you our preliminary design of the engines that we have designed this semester. Our engine is called the MTF-216 Bravo. This is a low bypass ratio, after burning dual spool turbofan, producing 21,600 pounds of thrust. First, we'd like to acknowledge a couple people. Uh, from the Fire for Effect team, I'd like to thank Nick Bauwa. He's the liaison between our two teams. He allowed for a seamless transmission of communication between us, and also for everyone to be on the same page, page with what each other's teams were doing. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. Brenda Haven and Dr. Matthew Haslam, our instructors through the course, for their continued support. Now to introduce my team, my name is Kevin Romain. I'm the design team leader of MTE Propulsion. Alonzo Garcia. Laura Pelletier, Kaylin Goodenough, and Max Kalinkin are all members of MTE Propulsion. As an overview, we'll be going over the project scope, uh, parametric cycle analysis, a constraint mission fuel analysis, our component design, a short little market analysis for our engine, and followed by our plan for detail next semester. For the project scope, the requirements that were given to both Fire for Effect and MTE Propulsion are on the screen here. Some of the key requirements to consider for us were the requiring requirements in red. These are going to be heavy constraining requirements. This will come up in our constraint analysis, but this is our carrier landing and takeoff, as well as our 5G breaker. The requirements in blue, these are going to be our uh, mission fuel analysis concerns. Uh, so we have the cruise at Mach 0 0.8, 30,000 feet as well as a target engagement at sea level in full afterburner. Before we can begin telling you about the design of our engine, it's important to understand the process that we took in order to create our engine. So first and foremost was understanding what a close air support aircraft was. So this was important reference for both Fire for Effect and MTE Propulsion to know what the dynamics of a close air support aircraft are and how that aircraft has to perform. We used a joint doctrine by the Army, Air Force, and the Navy to define what close air support was. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Once we understood what close air support was, we can begin to create our design parameters that make up an engine. These design parameters are your compressor pressure ratios, your turbine temperatures, bypass ratios. Once we had an initial set of parameters based off of present, uh, excuse me, based off of technology from between 1985 and 2005, we were then able to perform several analyses, including the mission profile and fuel, constraint, and a sensitivity analysis to change and optimize those parameters to get the best possible engine. Once we had a good set or a great set of parameters for that engine, we were then able to establish the design point for the entire engine, such as the thrust loading, wing loading, and the fuel consumption parameters that we needed to achieve. With that design point, that we jointly decided upon by Fire for Effect and MTE Propulsion, we were able to then begin a component design. This is where we really get into all the technical data in the engine. We had to find out the, each additional component design point. There's the engine design point, and then each component, the inlet, the turbo machinery, the burners, and the nozzle, are all designed at different design points. Once we had the mathematical designs of all of our components, we were then able to do a 3D drawing or a CAD model of our engine. For understanding close air support, we used the Joint Doctrine by Air Force, uh, Joint Doctrine Army, Air Force, and Navy to define what close air support was. Uh, their reference was that a close air support aircraft was an aircraft that had to have speed, range, maneuverability, and firepower to target hostile forces, either for suppression or for destruction, and most of these attacks will be in close proximity to friendly forces. So those requirements of speed, range, and maneuverability really weigh on the requirements of our engine. 
We need to make sure that our engine is able to have the maneuverability it needs to perform 5G maneuvers, as well as be able to make fuel consumption so that it can have the range. We looked at a couple aircraft to see what the need for a close air support fighter was. The A-10 is facing one of its last deployments, and the A-10 is the primary form of close air support by the Air Force. It will have entered into the, into the armed services in the mid-70s. It's been around for a long time, and we seek to keep performing that mission of CAST that it does, but also introduce that high threat environment and the maneuverability of a fighter. We also looked at the F-18, which is the one of the few Navy-based close air support aircrafts. Uh, this is an old aircraft that was put into armed services in the mid-80s. We also looked into the introduction of the F-35, which is a very expensive aircraft, and it was introduced primarily for close air support, but through its development into a multi-role fighter, it went away from that close air, air support mission. It can't effectively perform that mission, so we seek to create an aircraft and an engine that will primarily serve that close air support mission. Alonzo Garcia will now be talking about the parametric cycle analysis. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> I know we went over the parametric cycle analysis. Uh, the purpose of this parametric cycle analysis is to uh, obtain performance parameters for the engine being designed based off of design limitations such as maximum temperatures, reasonable efficiencies, and the flight condition. Both the maximum temperatures and reasonable efficiencies were taken from Magni's text, uh, aircraft engine design, for current and future technology. This current and future technology consists of from 2005 and on. Using the Onyx software that came with the textbook, the parametric, the parametric cycle analysis was performed by uh, iterating the following the, uh, parameters you can see above in the table. These parameters consist of the fan pressure ratio, the high pressure compressor pressure ratio, bypass ratio, maximum afterburning temperature, and maximum uh, turbine temperature. As a starting point, the team looked at similar engines <clears throat> to get an idea as far as where we wanted to start as far as numbers go. Uh, some of these engines being the GE F-110 using the F-16, the Prime Winnie F-100 using the F-15 and F-16, and the AL-31 using the Russian fighter Su-27. In conjunction with the parametric cycle analysis, a sensitivity analysis was performed on the major uh, parameters for the engine. Uh, a small change in these parameters was done to see how two other important parameters changed based on those changes. These other two important parameters being the thrust specific fuel consumption and the specific thrust. As you can see in the table above, well, the most notable change in the sensitivity analysis is the change in TT4. This decreases our thrust specific fuel consumption while increasing our specific thrust. This is a, a benefit for us, but because our primary mission only uses maximum power, which is in full afterburner, and military power being uh, without afterburner, this benefit would actually disbenefit us. Therefore, the team decided to not change TT4 and go with the other values chosen. Uh, after many iterations, uh, these final des design choices were chosen and consist of a fan pressure ratio of 4.35, a high pressure compressor pressure ratio of 5.51, overall pressure ratio of 24, bypass ratio of 0.95, maximum turbine temperature of 3200 degrees Rankin, and a maximum afterburning temperature of 3700 degrees Rankin. These values were then used for further analysis for the engine, as well as a component design for the engine. Next, Laura will take us into the constraint analysis. Thank you, Alonzo. The important parameters in performing a constraint analysis are the thrust loading and the wing loading. The thrust loading is the thrust at sea level over the total takeoff weight of the aircraft and is essentially the power required for the engine. The wing loading is essentially the size of the wing of the aircraft. The basic forces of thrust, weight, lift, and drag on an aircraft can be used to derive a master equation as a function of the thrust loading and wing loading to create a constraint diagram. One of our two most constraining legs of our mission was the carrier takeoff. We used a weight fraction of beta equals one. The weight fraction is the current aircraft weight over the total takeoff weight. So a beta of one means that there's currently 100% of fuel in the aircraft. The constraint line produced is the vertical line as shown. The vertical line represents the stall line of the aircraft. 
So the aircraft cannot have a wing loading anywhere to the right of this line. Our second most constraining leg of our mission was the 5G brake turn. The weight fraction beta was reduced slightly, while the, since the aircraft will be using fuel to climb to an altitude of 30,000 feet. The constraint line produces the curve as shown, and the aircraft cannot have a thrust loading at any point below this curve and still be able to perform the 5G brake turn maneuver. That being said, the solution space for a thrust and wing loading is above and to the left of both of these lines. Both MTE propulsion and fire for effect selected this design point in together. We selected a thrust loading of 1.2 and a wing loading of 75 pounds per square foot. We also wanted to verify that these constraints can be achieved with the design point that was selected. So we use weight specific excess power plots or piece of S plots. They illustrate a flight envelope for given for the inputs of the weight fraction, the number of Gs, and if the afterburner is on or off during that leg of the mission. We were, con since the design point was close to the 5G brake turn constraint line, we were concerned about being able to sustain the 5G brake turn, so we <coughs> developed a piece of S plot. The orange line represents the stall line for the aircraft, and the star on the plot represents the maximum altitude and velocity achieved during the 5G brake turn. This resulted in a positive piece of S of about one foot per second, so we can sustain the 5G brake turn. Now Max Kalinka will talk about mission fuel analysis. Thank you. All right, uh, we've done mission fuel analysis to uh, check our uh, engine's performance regarding fuel and uh, current configuration. Uh, uh, in the beginning, we took the basic uh, mission profile given to us by F4E, and we've elaborated into a more comprehensive mission fuel. Uh, mission profile, as well as the current aircraft fuel limit of 9,600 pounds. Uh, uh, we took the mission profile uh, that we made and we had two variations. We dropped the bombs, uh, dropped the payload on target on one variation, and we kept the payload and brought it back to the aircraft carrier or the runway in our second variation. Uh, this, is, this table represents the fuel burn uh, in the first variation where the bombs are dropped. Our most demanding legs are the cruise legs, highlighted in yellow, and the 5G engagement of the target at sea level, highlighted in yellow as well. We're burning about 7,900 pounds of fuel when we drop the bombs, uh, uh, drop the payload on target. Uh, this uh, table demonstrates the fuel burn of the second variation where we um, keep the payload and bring it back. Uh, we burn, uh, uh, we burn 8,100 pounds of fuel this time because we have to uh, bring the bombs back, so we're spending about 200 pounds of fuel more. Again, the most demanding legs are the cruise legs and the 5G engagement at sea level. In, uh, in order to save some fuel during our climb legs, we've incorporated f best data and plot. Uh, in order to do that, we had to break down our uh, climb legs into three sections. Um, the graph above me shows uh, the plot. Uh, the yellow line represents the minimal fuel to climb path, and the red line represents the altitude of 30,000 feet. In order to uh, have an efficient climb, our aircraft has to speed up to 660 feet per second first, at which point the pilot will uh, initiate his climb. He'll climb to 25,000 feet and uh, reach a speed of Mach 1.8. And then he'll finish the climb at 30,000 feet, maintaining Mach 1.8. We're saving about 100 pounds of fuel per, uh, per climb. Next, uh, Kevin will take us to component design. Thank you, Max. For the component design, it was important to recognize what those design points were for each component of the engine. The inlet design is based on the maximum corrected mass flow rate that the inlet will be facing throughout the mission. This means the most air required, the most mass flow required to get the appropriate thrust to perform the maneuver. This will occur at the uh, 5G engagement, or excuse me, the 5G brake turn. The turbo machinery design point will be at a theta brake condition. Theta brake is your maximum stresses that will occur on your turbo machinery. We found this to be 15,100 feet in a Mach of 0.01, basically stationary. I'll elaborate more on this on the next slide. The burners are designed at a maximum dynamic pressure, or Q, at sea level. And the nozzle has two conditions that it's designed to. It's designed for the afterburner throttle condition, or the, uh, as well as the mass flow rate at all legs of the mission. This is a graph of our theta brake. This is for determining the turbo machinery design point. Theta brake is where you are flying your engine at its maximum compressor pressure ratio, as well as your maximum turbine temperature. 
This is the highest stresses that are going to be applied onto the high pressure turbine. You take your design point, this turned out to be 30,000 feet at Mach 0.8 and gave us a theta break of 0.9. You slow that down to a uh, Mach number close to zero and our design point is from there at 15,000 feet Mach of close to zero. Once again, these are the outputs of the parametric cycle analysis and the inputs that we put in for our component design. So we have a fan compressor pressure, excuse me, a fan pressure ratio of high F of 4.35 a uh, high pressure high pressure compressor pressure ratio of 5.51 giving us an overall pressure ratio of 24 our bypass ratio is 0.95 our maximum turbine temperature is 3200 degrees Rankine and our maximum afterburner temperature is 3700 degrees Rankine this is a 2d model of the engine that we have built um, that we have designed excuse me it shows all the Katia renderings uh, uh, at a horizontal perspective. Walking from left to right through the engine, you have the fan. After the fan, ducting goes into the high pressure compressor. It is then put into the combustor. At the exit of the combustor, it goes into the high pressure turbine. It is then ducted into the low pressure turbine. At the exit of the low pressure turbine is the conjunction of the bypass. The bypass came off of the fan and the fan the bypass and the core will then meet before it goes into the afterburner. The after, after the afterburner is a change in geometry to a rectangular nozzle and then the nozzle. I will now talk about the inlet design. A couple key features about this inlet. Uh, our aircraft is subsonic. Because it is subsonic, we do not need to design a ramp system to accommodate for shocks that occur at supersonic speeds. Therefore, it can just be a fixed geometry hole at the front of the aircraft for each engine. The design point of the inlet was based on the maximum corrected mass flow rate. This occurred at that brake turn. This gave a required inlet area of about 4.7 square feet. The installation losses throughout the entire mission are shown on this table here. Here's a couple of the important ones that we see. Uh, as you notice, the 5G brake turn has an installation loss coefficient of zero. This is because the inlet is designed for that point. Another key uh, installation loss coefficient to look at is the cruise condition, having an installation loss 0 0.08. This was initially a concern for us because it was a higher coefficient loss than we had expected. We were estimating a loss of 0 0.05. However, our fuel analysis accommodates for these installation losses and we are within our fuel limits, so it is understandable. Here is the 3D rendering of the inlet design. There are an in, there's an inlet for each engine on the aircraft and they're located just behind the cockpit. Max will now be talking about the fan design. Thank you. Once again, the fan was designed at the theta break, uh, which is 15,100 feet in altitude and at Mach 0.01. Uh, at that altitude, we have a you know, total pressure coming, in, coming into the fan as, at a APSIA and then a total temperature of 46, uh, 460 degrees Rankin. The mass flow coming into the fan is 133 pounds per second, and uh, the chosen alphas for each stage of the fan is 20, 25, and 25 degrees. Uh, some uh, design, uh, design requirements for the fan, uh, we have to maintain uh, the fan blade tip speed below 1600 feet per second, as well as having a hub uh, Mach number at station 2 below 1, and then a hub to tip ratio between 0.35 and 0.5. And uh, we needed a, a total temperature rise per stage of 93 degrees Rankin to, to achieve the required pressure ratio. Uh, here's the uh, values we used uh, when inputting, uh, inputting into the fan, excuse me. Uh, we have a Mach number uh, at the exit of the fan, uh, 0.5 coming into the compressor, and we have a rotor angular velocity of uh, 1,077 uh, radians per second, and a tip radius of 17.82. The picture above me shows the cross-section of the fan. We've done a constant tip design. Our tip again is going to be at 17.82 uh, inches. Our uh, number of stages is three. We have vanilla guide vane, uh, three stages. Each stage has a rotor and a stator. A rotor is uh, in light blue color, a stator is in dark blue color. Our total length of the fan is 16.43 inches, and our pressure ratio achieved currently is 4.4. This is a 3D rendering of the fan to help visualize. 
I'll also be talking about uh, also will be talking about the ducting uh, within the engine. Uh, all our turbo machinery is designed at different mean lines, so we needed to duct uh, the core airflow into uh, radially throughout the engine, as well as split the airflow since this is a turbo fan to the core flow and uh, the bypass air. We have three sections between the fan and compressor, between low, low and high pressure turbines, and then the, between a low turbine, low pressure turbine and an uh, afterburner. Uh, while designing the ducting, uh, we had three, uh, two parameters to watch out for, the L over H value and then delta Z over L value. Delta Z is the, the difference radially between the mean lines of the components. Uh, H is the height of the, of the um, height of the face of the fa uh, duct face, and then L is the length of the fan. Uh, when um, designing a ducting, we had to uh, make sure our L over H value is over three. If uh, that value would go below three, it means we have flow separation. And then delta Z over L value between 0 0.55. Uh, over, over this range would mean we need to uh, have a variation of the ducting, such as increasing the length. Uh, table above me shows the values for the three sections of ducting, and they're all within the ranges. Now Laura will take us into the compressor. Thank you, Max. The compressor was designed at the theta break condition of our engine. So the mass flow rate, the pressure and temperatures listed in this table are at the theta break condition. These parameters were kept in mind as we were designing the compressor. The optimum ranges for these parameters were taken from Jack D. Mattingly's aircraft engine design book. We, while designing the compressor, we ensured that each of these parameters stayed within these optimum ranges or very close to them to ensure an optimal design of the compressor. Some of the parameters that we iterated for our compressor design was the Mach number at station three or at the exit of the compressor of a value of 0 0.4, a rotor angular velocity of 2000 radians per second, which also has to be the same as the high pressure turbine as the compressor is being driven by the high pressure turbine and a constant hub radius of 7.1 inches. On your right, you can see a cross-section of our compressor with an inlet guide vane. There is a total of six stages, and it can achieve a pressure ratio of 5.86, which is greater than the 5.51 required. The maximum tip radius is about 9.8 inches, and the overall length is about 10.6 inches. Here is a 3D rendering of our compressor, so you can visualize what the compressor looks like. And now I will talk about the combustor design. The combustor is broken into four main zones, the diffuser, primary zone, secondary zone, and the dilution zone, which I will all talk about. The combustor is designed at the maximum dynamic pressure condition of our engine, so the total pressures and temperatures are at this condition. As you can see, the pressure decreases slightly throughout the combustor, whereas the total temperature increases significantly throughout the combustor. For the air partitioning of the combustor, we selected a wall cooling method of transpiration and effusion. We also selected a gas temperature of about 3300 degrees Rankin, which is within the range for low emissions of nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide. We also selected a combustion efficiency and equivalence ratio of 0.7 and 0.8 respectively to ensure stable combustion. <clears throat> these are also very common and conservative values for these parameters. We also selected a maximum material temperature of about 210, 2110 degrees Rankin. This accounts for thermal barrier coatings within the combustor, and this produces a cooling effectiveness of about 0 0.62. For the diffuser design, we selected a flat wall and dump diffuser. The diffuser has an overall area ratio of about 4.2. The area ratio at the flat wall exit right before the dump is three. We chose this area ratio to be three rather than the optimum area ratio of four to decrease the overall length of the diffuser as decreasing this area ratio did not increase pressure losses significantly. We also selected a total of three subdivided nine degree streams of air going through the diffuser. For the primary zone, we will have a single annular array of fuel nozzle fuel nozzles and air swirlers. There will be a total of 14 of these air swirler assemblies, and they will each be at a 45 degree angle, which is a very common angle for the air swirlers. For the secondary and dilution zone, we selected both the secondary and dilution holes to be plane shaped. There will be a total of 252 secondary holes, 
and a total of four dilution holes. The parameters that we iterated for our combustor design were the Mach number of the diffuser exit, which was a value of 0 0.07, and a mean radius of 8.3 inches. On your right, you can see a cross-section of our combustor design. The liner height was calculated to be about 2.8 inches tall, and the overall length of the combustor was about 20 inches long. Here is a 3D rendering of our combustor design so you can visualize what it looks like. And now Alonzo Garcia will talk about the high pressure turbine design. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, the design plan for the turbine machinery of the engine is at theta break. Using the Onyx reference file, the engine was flown at theta break, which is at a Mach number of 0 0.01, and altitude at 15,100 feet. These outputs were then used as inputs in the turbine software to aid in the design of the high pressure turbine. These inputs being the mass flow rate at the engine to the turbine, the inlet total pressure and temperature, and the exit total temperature. The main requirements for the high pressure turbine is a total temperature drop of 492 degrees Rankine. This is the amount of work required for, to run the high pressure compressor. Uh, additional requirements were also taken from Manley's text. Uh, the stage loading coefficient, flow coefficient, and velocity ratio ensure that the turbine performs at the um, wanted uh, efficiency. Maximum A and squared also ensures that the turbine does not see excessive stresses. And finally, the dish shape factor shapes the disc so it is not excessive in size as well. The main three parameters iterated in the high pressure turbine design is the Mach number at station two, the rotor angle of velocity, and the mean radius. The Mach number at station two was maximized to, while maintaining the Mach number at the tip of at least one, and a Mach number below 1.2 at the hub. The rotor angle of velocity was coordinated with the high pressure compressor to be the same since they both run on the same shaft. And finally, the mean radius was chosen to minimize the size of the disc. Uh, higher radius means more structure is needed to support the, the turbine, therefore um, increasing the, the size of the disc. Above you will see a cross-section of the final design for the high-pressure turbine. It consists of a single stage with a maximum tip radius of 9.3 inches, an overall length of about 4.2 inches, a disc shape factor of 1.42, and A in square well below the requirement of 5 times 10 to the 10th with 2.92 times 10 to the 10th. Uh, above you will see a visualization of the high pressure turbine as modeled in Catillo. Next, Kaylin will take us into the low pressure turbine. Thank you, Alonzo. To begin our low pressure turbine design, we analyzed the requirements uh, that would be needed to fulfill or to satisfy uh, a complete low pressure turbine design. The first requirement is an overall temperature drop of 443 degrees cranking. This would apply, supply the work needed to run the fan. The stage loading, flow coefficient, and velocity ratio, ratio were again taken from Matt English's text and produce a low pressure turbine with the proper efficiency. The maximum AN squared is based on typical low pressure turbine materials. And finally, the team looked to keep the dish shape factor below two to ensure uh, to reduce the amount of material needed within the disk. The Onyx reference file was again flown at the theta break condition. These are the station data inputs that were then input into the turbine design software uh, that, be, uh, that aided in our iteration process. These were the three main parameters that were iterated until all of the requirements were satisfied within our design. A Mach number at station two of 1.05 resulted in choked flow in the first stage of the turbine, which was desired by our team. The rotor angular velocity was selected in coordination with the fan to be 1,077 radians per second. And finally, a mean radius of 12.1 was selected. Note that this is approximately four inches uh, greater than the high pressure turbine, meaning that ducting will be required between the two components. This is a final cross-section of our low pressure turbine design. It is two stages with a maximum tip radius of 14 inches found at the exit guide, the tip of the exit guide vane. This exit guide vane is needed to bring the flow back to axial as it axial flow as it enters the afterburner. The overall length is seven and three quarters inches. 
The maximum dish shape factor was found within the first stage to be 1.139, which was below our requirement of 2. Finally, our maximum an squared was found within the second stage to be 2.74 times 10 to the 10th, which again falls well below our requirement. Uh, this is a final rendering of our high pr low pressure turbine uh, made in Katia. Uh, next, we looked into turbine material selection uh, because this was a de driving uh, or a major constraint in our design process. For both the high pressure and low pressure turbine, Rene 80 was chosen for the stator and rotor uh, blades. For the high pressure turbine, single crystal structures will make up the blades. They will also utilize a film cooling with cooling air taken off the last stage of the compressor. The first stage of the, the, first stage of the high pressure compressor or high pressure turbine will also use a thermal barrier coating as this is the most um, intense environment seen within the turbines. For the low pressure turbine, the, di the, bl the, di the blades will be made of directionally solidified crystals and will utilize convection cooling again with bleed air taken off the last stage of the compressor. For both of the disc materials, mnemonic 105 was chosen. This is a typical disc material um, and it has a slightly lower density than the A80. I'll now go into the design of our afterburner. The afterburner is comprised of two main components, the diffuser as well as the flame holder section. The main function of the diffuser is to ensure proper mixing, proper mixing of the core and bypass flows to reduce the overall pressure loss seen by the afterburner, and finally, um, to slow the flow down as it enters the V-getter flame holders. The flame holder section con consists of the spray, ring, spray rings where the fuel is introduced into the system, where it can meet the V-getter, where combustion can take place as it exits the afterburner. The afterburner was designed at our maximum dynamic pressure condition. These values were taken from the Onyx reference file when the aircraft, or the, when the engine was flown at this condition. Um, this, with the exception of the outer radius, which in our case uh, will be set to the maximum outer diameter or outer radius of our engine, uh, which is driven by our fan design to be 17.82 inches. When designing our diffuser, we took three main parameters into consideration. First, we looked at the optimum area ratio for our afterburner uh, to be, uh, this was 2.039. However, this resulted in a diffuser uh, with a longer length. Uh, we also looked to maintain a target pressure of 54.33 throughout the afterburner. Failure to maintain this pressure would result in a decrease in thrust uh, produced by the afterburner. And finally, after researching air, uh, similar engines and afterburners, the team looked to keep the design of the afterburner below 70 inches. The final diffuser design has an area ratio of 1.831, which resulted in an overall diffuser length of 37.5 inches. Uh, this, uh, using this uh, area ratio, the overall pressure uh, needed to ma be maintained throughout the afterburner was achieved. The next came the design of the flame holders. Two main uh, considerations were taken into account during this design process. First is that the stay time must be greater than the time at blowout. The stay time of our V gutters is a function of the velocity at, as, it, uh, as it nears the V gutters as well as the blockage due to the V gutters. Whereas our blowout time will be calculated using Mattingly's kinetic software. Failure to maintain this parameter will result in the flame within the V gutters being extinguished. Again, we also look to maintain or keep our overall length below 70, so considerations within this design uh, will take that into account. Our final flame holder design resulted in a stay time that was greater than our blowout time, meaning that our afterburner can successfully sustain a flame within our V-gutters. The team selected three V-gutters in our design, which resulted in an overall length of 22.9 of our flame holder section. Seen on your left is the final cross section of our afterburner with an overall length of 60.4 inches. Seen on your right is the CATIA rendering with all the components implemented into the system. Kevin will now discuss the design of our nozzle. Thank you, Caleb. The nozzle design, we decided to go with a rectangular shaped design. The rationale behind this was based on three different reasons. The first, a rectangular shape Going from a conical to a rectangular shape, uh, that geometry changed, 
That allows us to mask our turbine blades, which are the hottest part of the engine. By masking those turbine blades, we can reduce our radar signature, making us a little more stealthy. Uh, the second rationale behind this design was uh, there are only two moving parts on the nozzle, rather than each feathering moving on a conical uh, variable geometry design. It's just the upper and the lower ramps that will be moving. And the final rationale is uh, this is an, a, a system that can be easily introduced into a thrust vectoring design. It, not, it does not necessarily perform thrust vectoring now, but it, it can be developed into a thrust vectoring design. This variable geometry nozzle has two points of variability. Uh, the first exists at the throat, the throat of the nozzle. This is determined by the afterburner throttle condition. When the afterburner is off, the throat will be at an area of about 2.3 square feet. When the afterburner is turned on, that throat will need to expand to 3.7 square feet. The second point of variability in the nozzle is the exit area. This is based on the different mass flows dependent on throttle conditions throughout the entire mission, regardless of if the, if the afterburner is engaged or not. The required areas needed are a range between 2.6 square feet at the least. This is the cruise condition. And at the largest, it'll be a 5.66 square feet, which will be in a full afterburner, 100% throttle condition. The total nozzle length is around 40 inches. This is protruding out the back end of the aircraft. And the peak installation loss experienced is around 0 0.01. The installation losses from this are due to exterior parts controlling the movement of the ramping systems. This is a two-dimensional visualization of the ramping system in the nozzle. Area station 10 is the case area. That's the maximum area that the engine can be. The area at station 9 is the entrance to the nozzle. Area at station 8 will be that throat. And area at station 9 is the exit area. Uh, not seen in here, but the method of controlling the ramp systems will be uh, two actuators located at the A7 and at A8. The actuator at A7 will provide angular motion, moving the throat and the rest of the length of the nozzle. The actuator that we positioned at A8 will provide the variability in the exit area for A9. This is a 3D rendering of the nozzle. Uh, going from the conical to square uh, shape change. And then uh, shown on the left, you will see the nozzle at a cruise condition with the smaller throat and the smallest exit area. The nozzle on the right is at a full, afterward, full afterburner condition with the larger throat and the largest exit area that the nozzle needs to be. The overall dimensions of the engine from each component gives us a total dimension of around 191 point 191 inches. This includes the nozzle, which is 40 inches protruding out the aft end of the aircraft. This is a 3D rendering of the installation of the engines into the Hammerhead aircraft. Uh, the nozzles are currently in a closed position in the, the smaller dimension. Here is a final 3D rendering of the aircraft that we have designed, excuse me, of the engine that we have designed this semester. It looks really pretty. For a market analysis, we decided to create three different variations of our engine. The Bravo edition, which is featured in the Hammerhead. The features of that were the uh, afterburner and a variable geometry nozzle. This provides that Hammerhead with a high maneuverability. However, it is subsonic speeds. Uh, the Alpha edition will feature a ramped inlet and a variable geometry nozzle, so removing the afterburner and providing an additional inlet to accommodate for shocks. This can be installed on a supersonic business jet and allowing people to move a lot faster from A to B. And uh, finally, a Charlie edition, which would be a ramped inlet, the afterburner, and the variable geometry nozzle, which can go into a supersonic aircraft or into the hammerhead, given it, it could sustain supersonic speeds uh, if the structures were up to par. I'm now going to talk about what we're going to be doing next semester for detailed design. So the project scope is to design and build a combustion chamber. We're doing combustion chamber research, and the test apparatus that we're going to be using for the combustion chamber, excuse me, the combustion chamber, will be a turbo that we will take off of a diesel engine. We are looking for 
high pressure ratios and high mass flow rates. And this is going to provide the test rig where we are virtually creating a turbo jet. The uh, compressor and the turbine in, inside the turbo will act as such for a turbo jet. And the goal for the project is to achieve stable combustion in the combustion chamber as well as flame holding. So this means we want to turn off the igniters and as we continue to put fuel into the combustion chamber, it will continue to burn, producing thrust. These are the labor accounting hours that we have this semester. Uh, this concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out, and we'd now like to open it up for questions and answers. No. Oh, okay. Um, I am not an engine guy. <laughs> but could you go to uh, slide 39, please? I am an aero guy. Uh, so why are the inlets kind of square? Is there some reason behind that? The square design was, um, we, the required inlet area was given to Fire for Effect, and it was what suited their needs best for the design of their inlet. Uh, being a square design, we did account for some of the losses that happened because of this. Uh, the sharp inlet lip means that when we're at a static condition, we have uh, pressure losses of around uh, 0 0.89, 0 0.9 because of that sharp lip. But it was mostly created for the uh, combination for fire for effect. Okay. Do you think uh, with your uh, recommendations uh, for a more efficient inlet, if they would have taken that, because uh, you know, for them, if you look at it, it kind of adds more skin and area, and um, that equals drag, which you know, reduces uh, <laughs> the stuff. So, um, or maybe that was could be a, a recommendation you can make to your your partner team that you're, you're designing for um, in the future. Um, and then go to slide 95. This may be out of the scope of your design, but I don't know if um, you guys were required to, to think about costs or anything like that. But I kind of would like to see like, maybe what it would cost to, for each design or, um, or even the fuel consumption for each um, for the team you're, you're designing this for because fuel is definitely you know, a, a driving factor for, um, for them. And, Fuel cost money, etc. But good job. I think it was, it was interesting. We did account. Um, Fire for Effect accounted for some cost in it in the aircraft based on uh, previous engines design. They took like an estimated value for the engine. As far as thrust specific fuel consumption, dependent on the leg of the mission. Uh, for our cruise condition, our thrust specific fuel consumption is about 1.3, and then for a full afterburner condition, it's around two. Uh, for further research, we can look at how much the fuel cost would be for everything for that. Thank you. Good job. Um, I'm also not an engine guy, but I am an airplane guy. Uh, so that's kind of like where all my questions are based. Um, why did you choose to name it the MTF 216 Bravo? I'm just curious. Uh, MTF, M is the more than enough propulsion, our team name. Uh, TF is low bypass ratio turbo fan. And then 216, we produce 21,600 pounds of thrust. And then Bravo is just a, very, a variation of the engine. Okay, cool. Um, so my first question is, how do you plan to start this engine? Is it going to be uh, fed by an APU or? Yes, it will have an APU. And uh, it, it'll either have a built-in APU or in many cases it could have an external APU. I think in a lot of carrier editions, they have to be built in. Okay. Um, why did this might be for the, the other team as well. Why two engines? It's usually more um, fuel efficient to go with a single. And in this case, we're kind of limited on fuel. So why did we go with the, the two? We thought about that very early on in the semester. Um, also, one engine would provide a smaller total diameter for 
the propulsion systems. But the rationale behind choosing two engines was uh, we're flying in a high threat environment in the event that you get shot at, one engine goes out, you still have another engine that can get you through the rest of your mission and get you home safely. Okay. Um, on slide, I didn't write it down. It was the one where you said what engines you looked at before. Yeah, slide 15. Um, did you guys look at any more modern engines, kind of like the F-35 or the F-22 engines at all? We actually have an entire list of engines that we looked at for, um, as far as like thrust, uh, thrust values. We have a value of around 15 engines in a spreadsheet. These were just the ones that were closer to the design that we were looking to achieve. But we did look at a lot of different engines, every F-16, F-18, F-22 engine, F-35 engine as well. Uh, the, the temperature at the exhaust, you said, was 3,700 degrees ranking? That's the uh, afterburner temperature. Yeah, yeah, it was the afterburner. Mm -hmm. um, is that suitable for a carrier blast shield? Did you guys look at that? I did not. Okay. I, I don't know what the temperature spec is on. I was just wondering if you guys were. Uh, slide 28. I just want to say good job spelling ordinance correctly. A lot of people <laughs> screw that up. We actually got a lot of people to say, oh, you spelled ordinance wrong. And then my explanation was, no, we're not trying to pass a law in a city with an ordinance. <laughs> yeah, you guys did a good job. Uh, slide 30. So here you have a minimum fuel to climb. However, pilots rarely fly that minimum uh, profile. So what would be a more realistic fuel burn to climb rather than just this minimum? Uh, a more realistic flight path would just be to do a steady climb up to 30,000 feet. Um, if, if we were to take that off, the minimum fuel to climb path, it just burns an additional 100 pounds of fuel. We are, we are well within our limit. We have a reserve of about 19%, which is higher than the 10% needed by the Air Force and the Navy requirements. Okay, I was just looking at what would be the more realistic number, so about 100 pounds more. 100 pounds more, cool. yes sir. Uh, 100, 100 pounds per climb leg. So for okay. a return leg home, it would be another 100 pounds. Gotcha. Um, I don't know what your requirements are for this class or your detail class, but did you guys think of um, any of the auxiliary systems that would come off of the engine, like bleed air, electrical systems, lubrication? We did account for bleed air. Um, we have an 11% bleed off the exit of the compressor. 10% goes to cooling in the turbine, and 1% goes to uh, actuators in the aircraft. Also, for uh, electrical systems, we did look at electricity that we were producing. We produce a conservative amount of electricity for power systems, but uh, neither team really went into full electrical analysis. I was just wondering how those, like the electrical generating system would hook up to your engine. Yeah, kind of their interface between the two. I don't really have an answer for okay. you on that one. <laughs> um, the other thing, so that's, this is with the other team as well, this plane can do supersonic flight. You guys give it enough power to do it, it doesn't have to drag to keep it, to prevent it from doing it. However, you have uh, design limitations in their, um, their structure, couldn't handle the forces, and then your inlets aren't designed for that. So were there any plans to put a limiter in here to prevent a pilot from taking this thing <laughs> where he's gonna break the plane? <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. We've talked about how we're going to accommodate for that. We definitely have enough thrust to take you to supersonic speeds. It'll just be uh, a computer that'll control the throttle condition of the engine, which could actually piss a lot of pilots off because they want to go faster. But It'll give somebody them the acceleration. Ferrari and limiting them to 65 miles an hour. Yeah, yes, sir. It'll give them the acceleration, though, which I think is what they truly need in a high threat environment when they're being shot at. It'll get them up to Mach 0.8 very fast, and they can climb very fast they just will not be able to go supersonic, which might not be a concern when you're dealing with close air support and you're close to the ground anyways. And when you got other bad guys in the air chasing you down, it kind of sucks. That's also a concern too. So, um, slide 52. I went to... Yeah, so when you were talking about this slide, you said that, um, most of your parameters stayed within there, except for some, which you tried to keep very close. What does that mean, very close? And why didn't you just make your design range to incorporate what you actually designed to? Laura, would you like to answer that? 
for all six stages of compression, it was very hard to get all of these values within these small ranges. So I tried to make, do my best to make them within all, like, as many of them as possible within these ranges. Um, I, if they didn't fit within the ranges, I made sure the stage loading and the flow coefficients were below the range and not above. For the diffusion factors, I made sure they never went above 0.6 because once you go above 0.6, your pressure losses drastically increase at that point. So wouldn't your design range then not be the 0.55, it would then be the 0.6? It, it does, that's kind of what I'm getting at. We say your design range is, it really wasn't what your range was. Yeah, these are just the optimum design ranges for compressors. Okay, and the last comment I have is, it would be beneficial to have a slide in here talking about your requirements and then how you met them. So just a list of requirements and how you met it. But that's all I got. Good job. Thank you. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, go to 35. Okay. Uh, when I look at when I look at the turbine, um, you've got a duct that's going outward, and then you've got this long, long diffuser duct, and then you've got a fan duct that's staying way out there. Could you could you have come in some on the fan duct a little bit earlier? and not done as much outward motion on the turbine duct, and then that, you, may have, you may lose a foot of, because I look at where your flame holder and spray bar is compared to the afterburner, it's like over half your length is stupid duct. And so you'd love to get rid of some of that by, did you, did you look at, could we do a trick upstream of that to help solve the problem? I don't think we actually ever thought about that. Um, we. Considered the bypass to be almost fixed, but Max might have a little more detailed response. Um, uh, we took the inlet diff uh, diffuser, I mean, not inlet diffuser, diffuser of the afterburner, and brought it down in uh, to be right at the exit of the low pressure turbine. That increased the overall length of the afterburner by 10 inches. The boiler, the duct right now is 7 inches, so it kind of saves 3 inches there doing the constant. Uh, constant, constant outside? Kind of constant outside, yeah, save the, save the, save the length. I'm just surprised because you've got you've got so much more volume on the outside. You've already pushed the fan duct in a little bit. You get all this extra. You're fighting against yourself when you try to diffuse it to the inward direction versus if you had. You see what I'm saying? If your fan duct is in a little bit more, then you get to diffuse just like your just like your in your burner where you've got three ducts diffusing. That, that, that works great. Okay, and so you're, you're trapped in this design by bringing everything way to the outside. It, it, I know you got a mass mock members and all the other nifty things that Hayden teaches you about, but but you got but you may be able to set yourself up by pushing everything in a little bit at the mixing plane, so then you can play a game both radially inward and radially outward, and so overall you may win a, in, in the in the speed. I don't know. It's just so, it, 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 you see it when you when you're sitting here when you're designing each piece part, everything looks great, mm -hmm. but when you look at it here, you go well you went out and go in, you know, and so that that looks funny. But that overall very good presentation. Is there a fire for affected person? The whole team. There you are. Uh, this is almost painfully realistic. Okay? It's gonna happen to you. Your government customers are going to give you a misguided requirement. And it is your job as the contractor and the designer to push back. Because this bad requirement is leading to the design mismatches. I'll go up here. We talked about survivability, and that being one of your uh, considerations. Think about separating the engine form. That's typical on this class of airplane. You can use as far as possible in case you don't want to. Yeah. Did you guys include penalty for armoring those engines? Put the small equipment in? Uh, when I look again at the airplanes you were comparing to and using in your baseline, uh, the F-18 is a supersonic airplane. It was originally designed as a fighter that made it about 15% bigger and had a secondary air-to-air -air capability. Uh, the F-35 also is supersonic, secondary air-to-air -air capability. Somebody said TSFC is 1.3? Uh, yes, sir, at cruise. Boy, that seems nice. And what's the, what's the thrust level to see 
Uh, thrust available at sea level is 42,000 pounds of thrust at maximum afterburn. So that's 50% more than the F-100 that's in the uh, F-16. Yes, sir. The design requirement was that we accomplish a 5G break turn at 30,000 feet, and that required a lot of thrust in order to accomplish it. Now, if you go about that requirement, I didn't see you had to sustain it. In order that piece of S had to be equal to zero, you could not have it. Now, I saw it was at D5Bs. So, so there need to be better requirements now, necessarily. The engines that you looked at, I just think the wrong class. These are all uh, for heavy fighters, F-110, F-100, and F-31. Um, that's just one thing I looked at. That's when I looked at the requirement for this airplane, I think A7. Right. Right, yes, sir. right performance class, right payload class, is there anything you want? Uh, I love your constraint analysis. I wish I could get my question. I wish I could get my answer. Okay. Uh, put them all on one, put them all on one chart and show the entire design space, show that thrust weight and loading that are pretty good. You got 90% excess fuel, is that what I heard somebody say? Yes, sir, 90% reserve. The airplane needs to be resized. We left room, we wanted to improve the fuel consumption to leave room for additional lawyer time to be added at the end of the mission. The New York airplane's oversized. That far over the requirement is oversized. Yes, sir. Um, on slide 35, you have the uh, engine and fuel ratio. Yes, sir. Reference the stations by number all through the brief, and you needed to number those. Want to echo the comments about the inlet, and this is another place where I almost, I almost had a flashback. It's entirely typical for the engine guys to blame the airframe guys for problems, and then the airframe guys blame the engine guys for problems back and forth, and then eventually nobody takes responsibility. And I have those square corners. Cannot have sharp edges on the subsonic inlet and, and not a, 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 what was your loss for those corners? 0.8 percent? Around 0.9. High point eights. Uh, percent. Nine per uh, it was a ninety yes, ten percent loss. It was around ten percent loss. Okay, then ten percent loss for you. So you have that. Uh, what's the speed of sound? Uh, what altitude sound? Pink one. At uh, 30,000 30, feet, it's seven hundred and ninety five feet per second. Say level 820 feet per second. How much is 30,000 feet? 795 feet per second. Okay, yeah. Oh, excuse me, that's our Mach 0.8 condition. I apologize. It's uh, 990 feet thousand, per second. 1,000 feet, feet per second. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, sir, 16 is the maximum. We're below, we're below the 1,600. You got several charts like number 52 where you've got a parameter and a design range, and then you don't tell me what the actual value is that you actually used are. You need to put all that information on the slide. I love your graphics, love the, the, the idea, the, the pictorial views of the engine, those are really nice. And more. Yeah, I just do that all the time. I, is, is this a vectoring nozzle? Uh, sir, it's not a thrust vectoring nozzle right now. It has the ability to be turned into a thrust vectoring nozzle. It's an easier design to perform a thrust vectoring nozzle. Sure. Oh, yeah. I thought it, was, I thought it just looks like a vectoring nozzle. I, I wonder if the airframe guys can do that. Uh, but I, I look at slide 89. Why is 810 ahead of 789? Why is it on the wrong side of that? Did I miss something? A10 is the, or like a, it's the maximum area that the engine is. So our, that's our limit on the design. So uh, it's the maximum diameter that the engine can be, and it's just the casing of the engine. And thanks for putting the test plan in for next semester. I thought that was a nice touch. Dr. Strayman. First of all, very good presentation. You keep mentioning the 30,000 uh, foot uh, design. Uh, is, is that a little on the high side? How 
relative-wise for close air support? It is from... Under the impression that a significant amount of close air support occurs at uh, much lower altitudes. I guess they're for, that's the cruise condition, that was a required cruise condition, but once we get to uh, on the, the target, once we get into the area of operations, we are at sea level doing a time on station, waiting for a call. Okay. Uh, a lot of aircraft engines have gotten into serious trouble at that low altitude uh, in the close air support flow by ingesting uh, dust. Uh, does your engine have any features that can uh, minimize uh, getting glassy dust deposits uh, going back into your combustor and turbine? There's a, the ducting from the inlet into the fan will help to limit that, but there is no screens or anything to eliminate it. Okay. Some engines have given up about 90% of their life um, when they did have to operate in a high dust environment. Um, in terms of uh, your uh, turbine material, uh, I think somebody had said that uh, Rene eating would be used as a single crystal alloy, and it's never been used as a single crystal alloy. Uh, it's also a relatively uh, old alloy, but uh, not too uh, uh, good a creep strength. Uh, uh, what was the metal temperature that you were uh, planning on operating, and what was your life requirement? So within our material selection of the turbine, we just looked at um, typical values that were given to us in Mattingly's text um, for different types of uh, the different stations within the engine. So Rene 80 and like I said, Mnemonic 105 were the um, one of the two options that were given to us um, for those design. Uh, we didn't look into the exact um, material temperature that these would be operating at. Um, our analysis did not get uh, that in depth at this at this point, um, so I do not have an answer for that. So. Okay, so you haven't uh, calculated the uh, actual metal temperatures and stresses that your uh, turbine would be uh, operating at. Uh, we did not go in that uh, that far in depth at this point in our analysis. Okay. Uh, in terms of the uh, afterburner. Sir, we didn't really look into material selection very much. Uh, I know that we're going to need thermal barrier coatings on um, the inside liners, um, maybe uh, like a nickel-based alloy or a titanium as the components for the afterburner and the nozzle because there's a lot of uh, material that needs to go into the entire design because it's long. So we might want to go with the titanium because it's lighter. Okay, so this one. Basically, some additional preliminary design work needs to be done then. Yes, sir. We didn't do very much research into the material selection for the entire engine. Okay. Thank you. One more question. Uh, these inlets are, are not sheeted. Yeah, they can run the arm bits on the MAT. Requirements is high with that, but it's not these. That's an old, that's old in this. Yes, sir. Are there any more questions? Thank you.